Jason, what's up, man? How's it going? I, uh, I'm very, very excited for this conversation, uh, my friend. Um, you and I had some long conversations as we were just recalling, I think it was like five years ago, uh, ways to do things with each other. And I ended up going my route with Arcona, but, uh, I have very fond memories of our conversations and philosophies about money and business and the world. And, uh, I'm very excited now that you have had an event just recently that I got the text. I saw it on, uh, online. I'm like, yeah, nice full circle. So I get to hear the full story and for the listeners in, I haven't heard it yet, so I'm I'm super curious. But Jason, why don't you just for the listeners give a little bit of your background? We'll get into you know what you're doing with with, with Produce and what you did with your special partners, but maybe just kind of getting up to like sure. what who is Jason and what's sure. and then we'll get into your philosophy too. Sure. Yeah, I guess it's all kind of tied together, but um, I guess I relate to coming from a uh, not an entrepreneurial family. Kind of like describe myself like loved learning about economics and business and investing, but um, didn't really have any anyone to talk to about it until really college and after that. Um, but as I started to uh, study investing in business, I realized how powerful of an asset class if you can um, you know, you learn about it and apply some fairly basic, you know, serve people, create value, like really basic principles. Um, that's really how you build whether it's a good business or a good investment. Um, and you're so coming I, at it from an investment. You, you, were you going through investment avenues first or was like the entrepreneurship avenue? Because the reason I'm asking that clarification, Jason, there's a yeah. lot of times where I've come to this realization that there's so many people that are operators, founders, but they didn't have the finance background. Sure. So I'm just kind of trying to understand for the listeners yeah. what lens you're bringing at it from. So my ideal role in college was to be like a private equity manager or like a, I didn't even know what that was or that that was a thing, but I was like, oh, I like analyzing things, evaluating the future, but based on, you know, obviously there's the hard analytics side of it, but there's also like, is this a good business? Is this serving a real need? Is this likely to be around 10 years from now? I found it's more that than it is running a spreadsheet. You know, anyone can punch some numbers. It's what are you punching into that thing with realistic things? So perfect. I love it. In college, that was what I was drawn towards. Um, but I had to, because we're so, starting from a relatively small capital base, I had to become an entrepreneur to um, realize my my goal. There was no big chunk of money to use as your uh, fun money to get it started? <laughs> I mean, there was actually, so that was part of our story, is my dad um, was part of a, a company, number five employee, and they did a cool thing for their employees. Um, I don't know, 45 years ago or something where they, they started an ESOP, an employee stock ownership plan. And uh, it was actually just one of the many ways that the, it was kind of out of self-interest. The owner, you know, could sell this way, could go sell this way, but an ESOP was, was one of the options. Um, classically enough, he's a Jewish man. So came from, had lots of good, you know, traditional connections in the business world who advised him to start this ESOP. So my dad got a fraction of the company, um, just being an employee, working as an electrical engineer, but they uh, eventually um, were bought by private equity. Private equity took them public. Then when they were public, they got um, bought by a larger, uh, their largest competitor. So every bit of the way, um, he got a little bit of liquidity. Um, we're not, you know, in the grand scheme of things, we're not talking trillions of dollars, but Certainly to a, a family that grew up on $80,000 salary, it was, it was some money. Yeah, going from a family that's traditionally relying on W-2 income and then saving, yep. different than value creating and being able to participate in the equity upside. For sure. Um, so it was during college around that time I realized my dad's going to have some money um, and it, it might behoove me to, to figure out how I could allocate that. So I kind of geeked out on everything investing. Um, and that ultimately we did one startup, um, out of college, which my dad chose to fund it. I just came along for the ride. Uh, cause I probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have, wanted, wouldn't, wouldn't have wanted to fund it, but I got in there and I realized that's an interesting game, venture capital. You know, you're, you're trying to pick the one winner out of 10 out of 20, like, okay, we've got some money. If we want any of this for our kids or kids, kids, uh, this is not a game we should be playing yet let's reverse the risk. Let's go back down to basics. And that's how we got into real estate was, uh, you know, rental real estate, just steady Eddie stuff. Um, 
2008 crash. I studied up the cycles to realize we were in um, some sort of meaning, meaningful down cycle. And we ended up buying houses like twenty, thirty thousand dollars a pop out of uh, two thousand. What year was that again? Uh, very end of two thousand two thousand eight. There's a window. I say like, just so happened we prepped a partnership with some seed money and window opened. Bought uh, nine about nine assets. Uh, built them up. They're worth I don't know two or three times more what we paid for them in a short period of time. And that was that was my first real asking my dad to kind of go out on a, on a limb, it worked out. Mm -hmm. And that's ultimately what allowed us to kind of continue that momentum and acquire an operating business. Cause I knew real estate's great. It's a great way. It's a, it's a great business, great way to create, create value, create wealth, but um, operating businesses where you can get in that double digit type uh, annual compounding returns. If, if you, know what you're doing. And, you know, obviously luck is a big part of that. <laughs> well, and, and you, d you did that and we're about to, to embark upon how you did that with espresso partners. But before we get there, Jason, I want to, I want to uh, further unpack your mindset on this stuff for the audience, because one of the things that intrigued me about you in our discussions five plus years ago was, um, and I, and, and I don't know how much you listen to the show, but we talk a lot about, you know, viewing and running the company like a financial asset. That's been the yeah. tagline now over the last few years that we've gravitated towards because it just makes sense now and just so logical. But what's so fascinating to me, Jason, is this concept of like, hey, we separate your leadership role from your ownership. Ownership is concerned with equity growth and the trade-offs of distributions versus reinvestment. But it's all this language is my point is that I've been introducing to the middle market privately held business owner that was a founder, creator, starter, whatever, that didn't have the private equity background, didn't have the foresight to get the education in college like you did. My point is, Jason, is like, when I started talking to you, you were always talking about asset classes. Like you didn't say we bought some houses we, and then we flipped them. You've been talking already, all of your language is through investment asset allocation. Mm -hmm. And then you landed on private equity as a good asset yeah. class, which is the opposite is like, Hey, I've got this business. What's it worth? How do we do this? And how does this work? Having to then learn what you learned. So it's just kind of yeah. the inverse. And I just think it's a great sure. context and container for everybody. So like, like when you think about asset classes, you, you mentioned something about VC and risk, then real estate, then private equity. So like, maybe you want to wrap this up with how do you view risk return and investments in general? And why did you get, why are you so passionate about it? Sure. Well, I think, you know, going back to Kiyosaki, you know, in the 90s and his, his book, uh, he talks about like the technician, which is basically somebody who's really good at a thing. And if you're good enough at it and you take it far enough, you end up with a business. Um, so you're basically whatever. In our case, we fixed the espresso machine. So maybe you're really good at turning a wrench and then all of a sudden you got all this need and you, you, know, you need 10 people to do this with you. Um, a lot of people get into entrepreneurship that way, I was kind of the opposite, which I don't know, everyone gets where they get for whatever reason. But, you know, I knew, like I said, I wanted to, I wanted to invest money, <laughs> but we had no money, <laughs> no Wall Street connections to go out and, you know, intern at a Wall, you know, some New York firm or something like that. So I had a kind of a different path, but like, to your point, um, I, I always looked at it, asset classes, um, you know, there's probabilities associated with these different things, right? Uh, studied, actually I studied a ton of things and it was, it was finding Warren Buffett that ultimately like solidified a lot of my, my thought process. And he talks a lot about probability. Um, he focuses a lot on 10 year history, like that it exists for the last 10 years. There's a decent chance it'll continue to exist. And then using some of those basic assumptions, like, really simple thinking, like how you can have a pretty good idea of where it's going to be. Um, and that helps de-risk it. Anytime you can buy an asset versus starting an asset, starting a company on your own, you've got that operating history. Um, I mean, we looked at franchises, we looked at lots of different things. Well, even a franchise, you got a great system. You're still starting something that never existed before. So you're guessing at your ROI. And it, even if it's accurate, you're going to be much more accurate if you take a thing that's already doing something. And then you're just tweaking it, right? Interesting. Yeah, I like how you Levels that. of probability much higher. And so this is all theoretical, like sounded great. Like now, then it was time to actually like you know, do it. it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and by the way, man, I you know what? I just remembered. So I have been bringing in, in 
I have a phrase that describes risk that is literally from our conversations five plus years ago. Mm. And I don't know if you still use it, but it's the gymnast on the balance beam. Oh, sure. Absolute risk. <laughs> dude, you, yeah, dude. Like, I, I like, it was like, oh my God, Jason is the one that introduced me to that concept. I don't, why don't you just, do you know what I'm talking about? Why don't you yeah, just cool. uh, recite that? Cause I think whether you're venture capital, real estate or operating a cash flowing business, I think it's yeah. a great context of like, Hey, what's risk? Well, kind of going back, uh, my dad actually had an opportunity to be a partner at the business. Why did he choose not to? Well, there's many reasons. Um, mostly it was time. He watched his, his boss just work trillions of hours. He's like, no, no, I value my kids. Um, there's different ways to be an entrepreneur, by the way. You don't have to do that. <laughs> this is a business, should work <laughs> business should work for you, not the other way around. Um, but anyways, part of the thing is, is when, you, when you're going to start something, especially investing business, um, you know, the immediate, for a non-entrepreneurial family, it's like risk. Like most middle, middle class family, like, I don't know what that's all about. I don't know, what, I don't know what's, what's going to happen. So I'm just going to go work for Target or whatever. Um, so what came to me along the way is just this idea of risk. Um, <clears throat> I realized that there's actually, there's two different kinds of risk. So there's absolute risk in the sense, take the average human being and apply the probability of a good outcome. And there's, there's that perspective. Then you have a trained human being who's spent some time, learned some best practices and look at their probabilities. Those are two very, very different outcomes. So business is no different. Um, and I, I think I use the hot dog I don't know why hot dog is just the backflip stuff in the, the Olympics, right? So I, um, I didn't know what the name of it was. So I'm glad I haven't been using that name. It was probably, I think it was an 80s, 80s game on a floppy disk there. They called it the hot dog and I played it with my friends in the basement. Anyway. Um, so yeah, something about that example um, resonated in the sense, you know, if you have an Olympic athlete who's trained and they're, they're going down the ski hill and they're going up and they're doing all the backflips, to you or I, that's literal death. You know, like mm -hmm. um, if we had to do that out of 10 times, what's the probability we would land on our feet? Close to zero. So from a from an absolute risk perspective, that's very high risk, low probability outcome. But, but so that guy who's been training for years, um, he could land that probably close to 10 times out of 10, and even, you know, 9.5. So taking that into investing is um you know, when it comes to private equity, you can, you can, when you own a operating business, you can compound capital faster because um, there's just more opportunity, right? But you can also lose it faster versus a, a multifamily piece of real estate. Um, however, what I, what, I, what I learned is if you study best practices, if you, um, I always say, find the best person in the world at whatever it is you're trying to do, do exactly what they do. Like, don't deter at all. Don't think you're going to reinvent the hand. Do that for three to five years. Then you can start tweaking it. But if you do that, um, even if you're half as good as them, you're going to be probably 99% better than most people. So that's a, that's a hack to get to the top with taking less risk. And, and it's putting context behind the person that's skilled at doing what they're doing to get the outcome that they want. And we shouldn't compare ourselves depending on our risks and our skill sets. Yeah. So with you looking at different asset classes, so multifamily, single family, venture capital, too much risk, not enough risk. So you land on cash flowing privately held companies. Yeah. So when you went out to look for espresso partners, you said you looked at franchise. So like, why, like, what were you looking for? What was the target? Cause essentially what I want to do for this conversation now that we've got the context is like, yeah. what was the goal? Cause again, knowing that like the purpose of this show is like, what is your, what was the, out, what's the outcome that you were searching for? And I'm kind of given this way. Cause you're, you've been, you've had the outcome very clear from the moment I met you, which is sure. the opposite of most of the people that I interact with. So why don't you kind of walk through, like, what was the goal? Once you landed on private equity being the vehicle and the asset class, then how did you start putting the things into motion? Yeah. So um, one final thought on the other thing was just that you can make money doing almost anything, but the, the more you know about that discipline, the, the, the quicker you're going to do it and the faster you're, you're going to avoid more brain damage. So knowledge is a <laughs> Amen huge. to that. Um, 
so when it came to the, I don't, I don't, I can't remember how I got to this, but I basically created those buckets of returns. Oh, there was a, actually, this is funny, not to be political at all, but I went to Trump University way back uh, 15 years ago. I'm one of, I paid a thousand bucks and I felt like I got a great return for what it's worth. Um, <laughs> they had a course that I ended up, a DVD set of all these different ways to create wealth. Um, and one of these guys talked about, I don't know, level five rates of return. Well, what's that? It's basically 15, 25% returns. Like well, who the hell gets, who does that? That's, that's, that's a thing, you know, um, you, know, you go to a traditional financial advisor and the you know, stock market does 9% on average, but we got to throw some bonds in there. So, you know, you're not really going to get that, uh, or at least we're not going to promise that. We don't even really want to talk about it. It's uncomfortable. We're going to, we're going to take one, one and a half of that, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So by the time you know that you're literally already at four, five, six percent. Well, studying enough of the rich, you know, you look at the Forbes 500. Who's on it? How they do it? Well, it's mostly um, first generation founders of businesses. So business has the unique ability to compound equity, capital, whatever you want to call it, at uh, higher than average rates in the 20, 30, 40 percent, depending on where you're at. You can get higher levels of compounding the more unknown at the beginning, like if you're truly starting a company. I, I believe there's a sweet spot in the middle where there's enough of a history, there's enough of a thing there that you're, you're not completely guessing. You know, For every Google, there's how many billions of completely failed startups. Mm -hmm. um, the cool thing about private equity is you're buying an asset that already exists. You've got that tra track record of some success. W what did you remove there? You removed... Does the world need this product? Does it need it offered in this way? Do I have the right cost structure to deliver that profitably? Like every new business starts out having no idea if that's true. Like you might have an inclination, you might have intuition, you're guessing on all that stuff. And by the way, just as an insert there is the last five plus years, people haven't even known that you had to do that because raising money was so easy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, interest rates are at zero. So go out and do some stuff. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, I derived that, I don't know, private equity was the highest, I call it risk adjusted return, which is a combination of what the gross potential return is times the probability of achieving it. So take bonds, for instance, high degree of achieving it, terrible return, you know? So that's, that's, that's a guaranteed way to go backward. So if you want to do bonds, go do bonds. That's why Buffett does not touch bonds. Um, then you've got your VC, which is, hey, you get a 10,000% return rate. What's the probability? Like less than 1%. Like, so multiply those two numbers together. And now, now you see what the risk adjusted return is, which is, I mean, the best in the world are 1 in 10, 1 in 20. Private equity is something where it's like you get 20 to 30% returns. How often? Well, you can definitely screw it up. I mean, I learned all the ways that you could screw it up. And I, I credit the Lord for guiding me through there. But um, yeah, when it was all said and done, I think we got 27.2% or something. Well, and, and to your point about the returns too, Buffett was, uh, I think it was like, what, six months ago or something like that. Someone was talking about flip, uh, flipping a coin, about a mm. hole in one, about like, it was like some ridiculous, outrageous bet. And all he did was ask what the odds were. And then he just, he did that back of the napkin math like you did. He's like, it was $20 million, but it's one in 1 billion of me hitting it. No chance. Yeah. And just like that quick, he was like, nope, not going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, he's huge on probability. Um, if he can't figure out what the business is going to do 10 years from now, he won't even look at it. So that's why he doesn't so, touch it. And before we keep going, do you have any comments? Because like I, I've, I've talked and unpacked this topic a decent amount, but like how technology and all that stuff could impact something that hasn't been here and what could be here in 10 years. So like, I don't know if you wanted to comment on technology, just in that, that philosophy. Yeah, actually, I think Elon Musk is a great example. Um, so I owned Tesla stock in 2009, 10, 11. I'm like, this is sweet. I love the thing. Um, it exploded in value way past what a traditional Warren Buffett or somebody like that, that has a, uh, a backward looking model, right? Mm -hmm. 
what I realized, because I was probably one of my bigger investing mistakes is, you know, $1,000 in some IRA or something like that. But um, obviously Tesla has exploded in value. And what was missing was the, the software as a service from all the artificial intelligence, self-driving. I mean, they're building cars, but they're, all, they're high margin cars, but they also have all kinds of other intellectual property. The challenge as an investor is um, how do you know what's the Tesla? versus what's the Coca-Cola, right? So even a Buffett, he's recently invested in Apple because he, he can figure that out, right? He understands that business. Um, what I switched a little bit to is looking at the founder and their commitment to, to what they're trying to do. So in his case, he's truly one of these entrepreneurs that like will die before the idea doesn't work. <laughs> So if you invest in anything of Elon, yeah, he's taking a lot of risk. And yeah, um, I mean, there's a lot of risk, but he literally will die before that thing fails. So mm -hmm. even though he says, you know, my chance of success is at 10%, part of the reason it's actually closer to 100% is because he's realistic up front and then he builds a plan that actually works. He's a very rare guy, but when it comes to investing in tech, um, it is a dangerous waters that the other thing about a guy like that is he, he evaluates all the tech out there and he literally picks what's actually going to work, you know, hydrogen and solar and all this stuff. No, he, as an engineer, he figured out what would actually work economically. And he built, you know, the entire car mm -hmm, company. Mm -hmm. from that. And he, he made it work because he made it work. <laughs> like he chose yep, that yep. as part of also why. No, I think that's helpful context, Jason, because as you continue to roll into this, I just, you know, I, because I also gravitate towards it. It's been here for 10 years and it's going to be here for 10 years. My late, my, my, my filter that I would put on that or the lens would be, is the product or service that it, people are consuming been there and going to be there, which is technology, cars, yeah. electricity. And it's just, I just wanted to make sure that we could, as you continue, you're like, yeah. you got the, the validity well, behind. Google's an interesting one. Like 20 years ago. Uh, I was talking to my sister, like if you own five stocks for the next 20 years, here's, here's a couple of them. And Google was one of them. Why? Well, we're, we're using this product every day. It's a massive market and they, they own the whole thing. Well, that's true until you have like paradigm shifts. We're in a paradigm. AI is now a paradigm shift. So um, Google could navigate that well and dominate. They could not. So it, it could go either way. So I have the most questions about a, a Google today than I would 20 years ago, mm -hmm. but there was yeah. good, they have a monopoly and so much resources to, to dominate AI. But if you miss it just a little bit, um, mm -hmm. you know, someone else can hop in and. and grab so when you take all of that stuff swirling around in your head and you got to place your first bet, you say, okay, yeah. like the goal is to go find a company to buy that's cash flowing and did you use the seed capital from the real estate to just shift asset classes? So like, and then how did you determine no franchise? So just walk us through kind of like starting this, starting sure. the story arc of like, okay, how did, how did you land on yeah. Espresso Partners? So I was, I mean, 24 when we did our first real estate stuff. So literally like no, no track record, obviously. Um, that's a big deal in the, in the, in the space. But, um, you know, my, my dad had said he's done a number of other investments. It was the only thing that worked like immediately. So that was a good, <laughs> time. you know, when you actually deliver on your results, that's a good thing. So we used, um, we took out a line of credit on some of that equity. We flipped houses for a few years, just like, just to have an active component because the, the passive wasn't going to cover the nut. Um, but that, that gave us the confidence that, okay, if we can su succeed, the reason I like real estate so much is it's, it's entrepreneurial, but it's also accessible. So if you have a house too, whatever, you learn the balance sheet, learn profit and loss, you learn how to manage debt. Like it's teaching you a lot of things. Um, gave us confidence then to raise a little bit more money uh, and then go acquire a business. And my goal was so that I knew it needed to be big enough. So they had some infrastructure in place. And initially that was like, I don't know, 60% of 70% of his net worth. <laughs> like that's probably that. <laughs> um, so thankfully the net worth expanded a little bit and, uh, you know, we were able to do something big enough, but not, it was still stressful. But. 
So let's talk about the, like specifically what were you looking for from the asset target then? So like okay. from you said some yeah. infrastructure, what industry, what size, management team, like how were you like what how much were you gonna pay? Yeah. And like just kind of the whole the whole smorgasbord. Smorgish board. My God, I couldn't even so, say So <laughs> again, um to the models thing, I literally bought a course offline. It was five hundred dollars from Diamo Corporation or something. It was um great I it's Ken Ken something other. Anyway. Um, this course was how to buy a business at a great price, literally walked me through every step I needed to do to, to, as a 24, well, at that point, 26, 27 year old to show up and look reasonably credible as a, as a small child. <laughs> <laughs> it's a small <laughs> child. I <love> it. Totally. <laughs> yeah, ask the right questions. Um, uh, be serious. So once I had the money kind of set aside, like my, I went to my dad, did a whole business plan. like. Hey, I think this is a good idea. Um, got that. Then I then I had the confidence to to go to the marketplace. Uh, and part of what the course talked about some really basic logic, which that's one of my hallmarks of like if it if I can wrap my head around it, then that's there's likelihood that it's true. Um, which was really like you can buy lots of businesses, you can do lots of things. L look at yourself. What are you uniquely gifted at? What what value do you have to offer the world and using a little creativity of if you applied it to X, Y, Z leverage, the business, the system, how would that play out? So we looked at a lot of things, but we ended up getting to this business is a espresso repair business, um, mixing espresso equipment. So looking at the industry, well, you know, the growth of specialty coffee, you know, espresso and all that had, average 10 to 15% compounding returns since the seventies, basic picture Starbucks being some of the first, you know, my mom was all Folgers until, you know, 2000, we didn't even know what espresso was. Um, so the market penetration was growing. Now I didn't do a lot. If I had been smarter, I would have paid more attention to that. Like that's a big deal. That, that was a headwind that served us just that that market is, is growing. So that piece of the economy is getting bigger. So if you own a piece of that, then, you're going to How did you find that? Where, where did you go to find that data? You Google, you know, just Google the stuff. Because um, I know, know some people, are, there's always, um, you know, I, I know one of the things when people are looking. The Specialty at Coffee Association is the association that runs the industry. So there's usually okay. some sort of, um, yeah, industry data that you can find. No, I think it's because, yeah, how big can the pie get? Is it saturated, not saturated? I mean, you're looking for growth. And if it's growing yeah. bigger than the economy, so you're not looking for the 9%, you're not looking for the 4%, right? Like you got a yep. specific, got it. Yep. So that was a piece. And then uh, it's a service business. So, yeah, we come from like a faith background, um, like just taking care of people. Like, yeah, I don't know how to do that. I like to apply my creativity um, practically and intensely, you know, so um that's what ended up happening with the Express Part. We had what we ended up specializing in was we needed enough locations, uh, well, the, coffee shop. Okay, sorry. I was gonna say, well, before before you go into the expansion, yeah. let's talk about like the person that who who would you buy it from? So you sure. found them? Did you find them through a bro that. broker and like you use an SBA loan? And then uh, it, sorry, I know we're kind of getting yeah. the nuance, but I think people like it is that. Uh, you, you you had started a fund where you were investing your dad's money, right? I just wanted to clarify that because you had said my dad's money. Like you guys weren't, you didn't go to your dad and say, hey, we can be 50-50. Like, because like I always say that that's the back of the napkin. Like we're at the bar, we're, we're going to be business yeah, yeah. partners, the business partner plan versus you said you had all this stuff we've already covered the ground on. And then you went to him and said, hey, here's a rate of return for a portion of your net worth. Yeah. And then you went to deploy that. Am I right? Yeah, so he's super rudimentary private equity. You know, um, but I, I, wanted, I wanted to grab the best models. I, I knew I wasn't uh, Goldman Sachs or one of these big outfits, but I wanted to take the best models and, and apply them to. So even when I, I created a management company, that's Gratus uh, Capital and Gratus Funds now. Um, that's been there since day one, all the way back to 2008 as a management company, set up a separate partnership so that the risk capital came in. Um, we had a pretty loose comp structure. It was just like, I need to make some money to pay my bills, but <laughs> most of all my upside is in creating value for you. So it was truly, um, 
yeah, it was a. It was I a think fan. it's so important to just highlight that, man, because like it, it could get lost, but that's a very important detail because in 2008 you had this inception and this idea. So then you yeah. go, okay, you got you got the you got the capital. What was the structure like? You say to take all of the equity. Was it a one one placement or was it like mm -hmm. what was the structure? How did you find it? And then what was day one like? Yeah, so family partnership. We created a tranche for real estate that kind of sat in the background for ten years. So that that money was allocated. Um, and then it was really just this other asset. So we had a portfolio portfolio of real estate and then this one operating business. We knew it was, you kind of, um, what do I say again to probabilities risk, like placing multiple bets is as much mind share as it is, um, splitting mm -hmm. up your money, right? So focus, we've always had a successful strategy in being very focused on one thing and do it bigger than try to be all things all over. Got it. So, yeah. So you, when you found Espresso Partners, was it like a local family that had started it and yeah. then built it up and like, why, what was their reasons for selling? And then how'd you guys, like, how, how would you guys structure the purchase of it? Yeah. So just process wise, um, cast vision for the acquisition in 2010, it's a year long process. Like it takes time to do all this stuff, right? So you, you got to kiss a lot of frogs to, to see what, what, <laughs> what actually makes sense. And I think there's a, there's an internalization process of like, you see an opportunity, take some time, to like internalize, what would it be like to run this company and let that sit. And like, it'll either lead you forward or you're gonna be like, nah. Um, so we looked at a lot of deals. Um, that's when I actually came through my attorney and a traditional Sunbelt broker, you know, kind of that. Mm -hmm. Super low end uh, middle market. Um, like I said, we needed to <laughs> we needed to write a big enough check so that there was some. We're not buying some convenience store that you know. Um, it's got some cash flow, some people. There's a little uh, bit of money left after taxes and debt payoff. <laughs> exactly. So we found this deal, and uh, it was a it was a family run operation um, who had uh, been in the industry and grown it to this. To a certain point, they had a complicated, uh, that's one of the things you always look at, why are they selling? Well, they had a complicated family structure, so they're looking to cash people out, and some definitely wanted to go, some were open to staying. And one of the lessons I tried to apply was from Warren Buffett, where a lot of his successful deals, he acquired family businesses. So they had that family pride in the business. Um, mm -hmm. And then oftentimes, you know, he's dealing in obviously $100, $500 million transactions, so the family cashes out their, their money's set forever. Now, what are they motivated by? Um, legacy, you know, like this thing, this is our thing. So mm -hmm. that worked really well for Warren Buffett. I, I, I tried to apply the same thing at a smaller scale. Um, let's just say it didn't, didn't end. It wouldn't work out as, as I knew. How you, did, how you just described Warren wants it to work. It did not work out just like that. That's what you're saying. <laughs> Did not work out that way. Maybe if it was a hundred million dollar transaction, no. But we uh, we had a couple guys stay on and tried to figure out a common vision, a cop common operating, uh, and we used all of our cash. We did no no SBA, no debt. Um, the reason we did that was again to that absolute risk concept. Was um, I did the I did the math on our real estate. We did that too, free and clear, just just because it was a crazy time, and I did the math. Um, if we did it, the real estate free and clear, it was like 12% return uh, initially. It ended up being much higher than that. But my initial calculation, if we leveraged, it was like 15% return. I was like, okay, so that's 3% more return. But I looked at based on the equity, it was like 25 times more risk from a probability perspective. So I was like, that might be worth it, but I don't know that yet. I'm not experienced enough to know how many times out of 10 I'm going to be able to leverage up four times, five times um, on my down payment. So let's just do it free and clear. Get get our um, wits about us and go from that. So like, I just like for for three times, three percentage point return for 25 times the, the risk. I'm like, yeah. Isn't it so, dude, I love it when you just break it down like that. It's just such common sense. <laughs> When the bank, <laughs> I, was like, I think the bank might be doing better than me on that. So I'll eva I'll reevaluate that and later on. You know, we've learned to use leverage appropriately, but it just felt better. And honestly, 
Um, we made a lot of money on the capital gains on those, but the cash flow was always spotty. We were dealing in North Minneapolis and it would have been a lot more stressful if we had been, you know, 25% down or 40%. Yep. Yep. So, so when you, okay. So like, wow. Why I think that's important for the story is that from what I've remember from your con- our conversations is that when you bought the business, so you have no, no leverage. And from what I remember, everything went perfect. Right. <laughs> okay. You, you, I just, I had to make sure my sarcasm really got across because it, which allowed you it, it, before you tell the story, Jason, I think there's interesting context here is that, I mean, since you and like the last five and a half years, since you and I were chatting, like how many Instagram ads, Facebook ads, like LinkedIn, Hey, buy a company for zero money down and all this stuff. It's so the whole get, you know, the Robert Kiyosaki, but the, with companies, but then they forget like, a building, you need to maintain it, get a new toilet put in and all those things. But like a company's different for so yeah. many reasons. Yeah, yeah. So why don't you just think like walk us through you close the first, I don't remember what the period of time was, but it took a little while, I think, for you to get the your feet underneath you and get it all yeah. stable based based on some unforeseen events. Yeah. So I was twenty nine years old, taking over a company, like I don't know, I wouldn't say zero leadership experience, but pretty close. <laughs> Um, so, and I, was, I laugh only because I respect you, man. <laughs> I just, your self awareness. <laughs> the good thing was I knew it, and I knew that I needed to figure out, you know, how to manage and lead, and who who was the right person, and all that stuff. So there's a little bit of trial by fire. To say I was uncomfortable is is an understatement. And then we had this, uh, you know, new partnership. We had guys from the old company. I brought um, someone else into the partnership, and we're trying to figure out how how to make that work. We use all of our cash to do the acquisition close to free and clear. Um, and then through a series of circumstances, um, we were pretty heavy on the management team. So we, were, we, we ended up, we were supposed to be cash flowing like 30, 40,000 a month. And we ended up being reverse that for a little while. Um, but I always knew, I needed a certain amount of time to learn the business so I could take it over on myself. But we had a ton of overhead um, that were burning. I was like, well, I need the overhead for a certain period of time. But at some point, you know, we don't probably need all these people. I think we had 18 employees and five of them were management, you know? Well, and didn't, and w- w- one of the things that I remember you saying too, that there was, you lost McDonald's, right? To right off the bat yes. too, that yeah. exacerbated yeah. that entire situation. That's basically what happened was that was, that was circumstantial through no, no one's fault just happened, but McDonald's was doing a certain number of preventative maintenance a year and we were overflow. So they had our primary vendor and then we were overflow. So when they went from three PMs to two, uh, the, the primary still got the same amount. And then our, it was like a f- cut in half or, well, it went to zero for a little while and then they, and it came back to half and eventually it went away completely. But um, yeah, that was a big concentration of customer, which we knew about. It's just one of the risks you take, right? Well, it's a uh, risk that it happened, right? I mean, but I think it, it, this is so helpful and so awesome, Jason, because all the ads that people see or the people that are call- the listeners that have a company that are getting called in and it's the 29 year old with some money. It's like, this is tough stuff, right? And so you're, yeah. you lived the and, management and the, and the big customer issue. Yeah. Like it was it was very stressful because I had my, my career, my net worth, my parents situation. And then eventually my wife ended up working for the business. So I had a lot going on in this. <laughs> it has to work <laughs> in the basket, so to speak. And, um, my first 18 months I say, I was, I was thinking about getting my MBA. I really wanted to just to have that traditional background. Um, the, the business though ended up sucking me in and I, What's I got the, my, <laughs> You I got your MBA, MBA, man. Yeah. <laughs> I, know I was going to get it. How to, how to run a, how a profit and loss actually works, how to use it, how that interacts with the balance sheet, all that stuff. I mean, you learn a little bit about that in college, but you get to actually apply that in, uh, when you have something. So, so yeah. I, yeah. I just, I, well, I think it's just so like, one of the takeaways that I think is super important out of this is you have the spreadsheet. You, ha- I mean, you had, you had all of the foresight that a lot of people then when they have their company don't have, right? So you're coming at it like with all the thought, all yeah. the internal rates of return, the specific asset class, how you're going to fund it, all the cash down. 
and all the shit still happens. You still get the management issues. You still get the big customer that leaves. So like, thank God you think about risk the way you think about it. And I just think that's so damn important. Whether someone's looking at selling to an acquisition entrepreneur, they're looking at buying a company, like you thought about all this stuff and the world still came to, it still came at you. (laughs) Hey everybody, Ryan here. Sorry for the brief interruption. This is going to be less than a minute. I just wanted to say that if you're getting the feeling that Jason had done a lot of research and built a foundation of knowledge so that way he can make the decisions that he's making, like why real estate versus venture capital versus private equity, how he landed on private equity, how he decided to grow the company and how he was making the decisions based on the investments he was making, why he chose the strategic buyer, And if you just essentially want the level of confidence that he had because he had the clarity of how this all worked, please just go check out the Intentional Growth Planning Kit. It's got all the podcast episodes in it from the past, as well as the Intentional Growth Scorecard that will get you thinking about how you're organizing your financials and how clear you really are on what your ultimate outcome is. What's your target equity valuation? What's your trade-offs between investment, reinvestment in the company versus distributions? And then how do you, within that container, make the decisions on your operations today so that way you can stay on track if you don't have those goals or that kind of clarity, you're kind of just fumbling around. So go check out the Intentional Growth Planning Kit. There's resources in there galore between the podcast and then the case study videos that show you what good looks like. So that way you can at least see what it looks like so you can understand the gap between where you are and where you, where you want to be. Hope you're enjoying the episode and I'll let you get back to it. Well, that's actually uh, and Warren Buffett's a mental mentor of mine. Of, I've said his name quite a few times. He said, part of the reason you buy an operating business is free and clear. Like He's like, if you get the right business with the right growth potential, you don't need to leverage. It, it compounds capital at a reasonable rate by taking reasonable risks. Um, if you, he said he, he, he learned a lot from these guys who are already billionaires, but then they leverage themselves three to one and they'll risk everything just... To be just a little bit dude, have you been following Carl Icahn's total dumpster fire, dude? Yeah, no, not at all. Oh, that is you got to get some popcorn, pull up net interest. The right. the in Hindenburg research, actually, Hindenburg has done two like 200 page articles. It's a freaking Ponzi scheme, dude. He's got margin loans on margin loans on margin loans, and he's got it to the point where he's leveraged up his own companies that he sell states like to upwards of $3 billion that they can't figure out where the margins loan loans went to Jason. And that somehow 3 billion ended up back in. So he's actually got the margin loans and then put the money back in. Like why to your point, he's a billionaire. Like what's the point? So, I mean, that's Buffett's been doing it for many years and he's, I'm sure seen multiple generations of this. And he just pointed out some pretty, again, something pretty obvious is like how much is enough. Um, how, how, I want to learn from other people's mistakes, not my own. And that, that was one piece of wisdom. I was like, yeah. That's a, that's a good piece to, to, to latch on to. So, and if you know compounding, if you know compounding growth at all, at 15, 25%, like even starting with a dollar, you will end up a multi, multi-millionaire if you do that for a period of time. So it's like a rule of thumb for people that like well, might. Some people are quick on that, but uh it it's just it's stupid. So is it, it's, is it's, it seven percent? Your money will double every ten. Yeah, something like that. So at fifteen to twenty five percent return, which is very reasonable in private enterprise, um, you know, you just don't need that much money if you just do that for a period of time, decade, fifteen. You might you'll end up potentially with more money than you ever need. Right. So I love it. So now now. Now you, you, you took that idea and then you did it and then you did, you got all of the glass that you could eat at once. <laughs> so yeah. what, what, what's then like, what's your approach to the people? Cause I know you have a unique approach to it gratuitous. So like, what's your approach to management strategy? Like maybe here's the best way to put it, Jason is you've got the operations that has to abide by the, the ownership's goals so like and i've done i did a mini series a few months ago about ownership and leadership so ownership has the irr goal right so you've got that established do you have a timeline and then where i'm trying to go now is now you've got the operations that has to execute ownership's goals so like how did you how did you tie that all together there's definitely some like 
numbers behind it, but the whole reason I got uh, put this whole idea together was really to to be able to have enough resources to drive positive change in the world. Like I saw this whole mechanism as a way for me to have the creative freedom to be able to serve in the way I felt called to with no inhibitions on money. So whether it had an ROI, didn't have an ROI, I knew I needed to start with some money before I can start applying it, right? So we took a very people-oriented approach to everything. Um, so it was at its essence in business, all you're doing is you're, you're reaping and uh, you're sowing and reaping. So if you, if you sow seeds of service, if you're taking care of your employees, if you're taking care of a real need in the marketplace, and you do that long enough and hard enough and just find ways to continue to add value, um, you're, just, you're just planting seed, planting seed. Eventually, you, you harvest that. So there's delay in that. There's, um, but it's also like gravity where you, uh, you create a, a decent, well, it's not like we're world class. Well, maybe, maybe we are. I don't know. You create a decent place to work where um, you respect people. I mean, this is like kindergarten stuff, right? You like, you listen, um, you respond, you don't take, you know, we're full of employees with, with bad attitudes, a whole, you know, all that stuff, but where you see legitimate room for improvement, like take the essence of truth in that and try to get a little bit better, a little bit better. You do that long enough in your culture with your, um, customers, you end up with opportunity. And, and I ended up planning on it. Like it. When I first started off, I was scared to death. I thought we were all going to die and burn, burn up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear that you just, you're, you, that, that's when you know you're a true entrepreneur, when you really feel like it, this could be the end. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going out as I thought. But eventually, well, what ended up happening was um, we, the first step was getting alignment at the leadership level. Okay. So we had a lot, I'll just say, we had lots of um, chefs in the kitchen and through my choice and not my choice, it ended up being just me. So it, it made it made it a little simpler. Um, I had like a, a revelatory experience when the last last cook was out of the kitchen. Uh, I just felt this huge weight come off, and all, and I suddenly just felt like I knew I knew what I needed to do, and now I had the freedom to do it. Um, so I I ended up. This is actually a wild story. I don't know if I. I'll try to tell this succinct version, but basically hey, I want to hear it, man. I want to hear it. During the chaos of getting this partnership figured out. Um, I hired a general manager and in retrospect, I, I, I know why I was a mistake, but I was basically hiring from a place of fear. I was, I was in, I was terrified. I was terrified. Of, like, <laughs> of course you just explained what happened. Yeah. <laughs> and, but I knew I needed a, a G, GM. So Found this guy on LinkedIn. I can't remember how I found him, but on paper, he looked perfect. And I met the guy and I was just like, um, with all due respect, I don't think he's the right fit. You know, I knew this as soon as I saw him, like not a good fit for whatever reason. Um, just an internal voice. And, but I knew I needed one. And I was, I was in the process of losing, you know, my management team. I had no idea if I knew if I could do it on my own. Um, but when on the day that the last guy left, I was sitting at lunch and, oh, I'm, yeah, the day that the last partner left was the day that this guy started. So, so I onboarded him in the morning, kind of shakily onboarded him, went out to lunch. In the middle of lunch, um, I just realized that a lot of the drama, a lot of the issues, it wasn't mine to own. Like, I observed it. It affected me. It wasn't fun. But, like, it just wasn't mine. Um, and I had this common piece that like, I don't know if you got this as the right word, but it was something along those lines, just a confidence, like, just, just do what you need to do, you know, like, okay, I can do that. And instantly as that peace, this peace just came over me amidst all this chaos. Um, and I don't know if it was an angel visiting me or what, but like, I just knew that this guy that I'd hired in the morning, my intuition was like, yeah, he's not the guy. So logically, I could play this out over two, three, four months and do the easy ease them out kind of deal. Or I could do what I know I needed to do, which was to fire him on the spot. I was like, shoot. So I marched 
went to lunch, marched back to the office, and I said, this is probably going to be one of the more awkward conversations I ever have, but um, I shared with him a little bit of that epiphany and said, I know, I know this is super weird, and I'm figuring out what I'm doing as a leader, but um, I, I, I'm going to let you go. And he had been between jobs, so I'm like, I'll pay you whatever you got to pay. But I, I walked back and, and, and fired him, basically. <laughs> So the thing, hire, fire, or hire slow and fire hire, fast. And you took that to heart, man. Um, but I just knew that this was the wrong fit. Um, so it was funny because this is what, again, I was getting my leadership sea legs is what I say and trying to, um, all these little intuitions that I kind of knew, but didn't have the confidence. All of a sudden I had the confidence. So my dad happened to be, he was, you know, fairly passive owner, but like, you know, a lot of eggs in a basket. We're all kind of paying attention, right? So he he doesn't travel a lot, but he happened to be on the, literally on the other side of the world. He was in Japan or what, Korea, one of these places. And he had been involved in hiring this individual. Um, so after I, you know, I let him know, he's like, oh, I'm going to tell your dad. I'm going to do all this. He's like threatening all this stuff. I'm like, dude, just chill out. Um, <laughs> but literally, my dad was on the other side of the world. And um, he called me, you know, as soon as we were in the same time zone or whatever, he's like, Hey, you know, this guy called me and what's going on all this stuff. And I said, dad, um, I know we're doing this together. Uh, if, if you want, if it's your, it's your choice to make ultimately, but if you want me to be the leader, let me lead. If you don't want me, you can fire me. Um, but if I stay here, you gotta let me lead. Um, and he's, he, he said, okay. And from that point forward, he became a very traditional kind of passive advisory. But that's the definition of passive is I'm not going in to the yeah, like, office. <laughs> I was like, you can come here and run the company yourself, or you could fire me and replace me. But if you keep me, you got you to gotta, you gotta let me do what I got to do. He's like, okay, son. So, Deal. <laughs> yeah, so so that must that, have been, yeah, that must have been liberating, I took, man. I took a two, three month deep breath. It was just like, there was a lot of drama in that first 18 months. Took a deep breath, calmed myself, and then uh, found a general manager um, who, I, again, this was like an act of God, but just a, just a, a guy that um, came from military background, came from Fortune 500. Um, what, what aligned us was the desire to serve. He had come from you know, military and, and bureaucracy a lot of red tape, you know, he wanted to do things for customers, but big fortune 500 company, he, he was limited. He's like, I just want to be able to serve people. Like, that's sweet. I just want to be able to serve, you know? And so he, he and I came on and uh, the other thing that happened was he, he bonded with our family. So like he met my dad, I didn't even do this on purpose, but he met my dad at some point and was like, recognized the situation to some degree of like, this is, this is important to this family. Um, and he put it in his mind to take us from, I think we're at under 3 million in sales. He's like, no, I'm going to take you to 15 million in sales. He, he decided that, but didn't communicate that. But from that point, um, I, it just felt like, um, like a hot air balloon. Like not, we're not Google, we're not Facebook, but it was like cleared out the, the leadership team, um, got alignment and then just started getting to work like little improvements here. And it was just kind of slow, steady, like meet with our customers, find out what's going on. What are your unique challenges? How can we help you with those amidst the normal stuff? And we started winning contracts and. Um, I, I, I want to, I want to un unpack some of the growth um, strategies, Jason, but I want to go back to, so your decision. I mean, you never, you never, it sounds like you never even stopped to think, Hey, I should just do this. And here's why I wanted to, for the listeners to get into your mindset here is it's so easy, especially like the, all these, um, these, uh, associations, entrepreneur or acquisition, or entrepreneurship through acquisition, the ETA world, the search phone world, or the primary objective for these individuals from what I've gathered from talking to so many of them is like to go in there, be the CEO. And that's where the seller's discretionary earnings comes from. Like they want the salary and whatever's left over after the debt and taxes. But from what you just said, you never once were like, Hey, I'm going to shift and pivot and be that myself to collect more cash or yeah. how, or how did I don't want to put words in your mouth. How did you think about that? I knew myself well enough 
to know that was a recipe for disaster, um, that I had a unique skills and abilities, um, but I needed a, num- a strong number two to, to bring it to life. And it was a big, it's, um, you know, intuitive you to bring that out because that was a, a act of faith and who knows exactly how it worked, but I didn't, I didn't have enough. I was pretty upfront with the guy, but I'm like, you know, we're doing okay. We're, I think we're break even. I think so. Um, <laughs> by hiring you, we might, that might be break. even. might not be breaking even <laughs> just enough to hire him. But I knew for me to have the creative freedom to run the company the way that I wanted to, that I had to make an investment. And I I have noticed in growth, there's always that pinch point where you can keep doing things the way you've been doing and and you're going to hit that glass ceiling where there's, there's an act of faith required to to level up. Um, But it's usually kind of, kind of a no brainer where it's like, if you want to get to a certain size, are you willing to go break even for a little while on the chance that you could get there? Like, yeah, that's a, probably a good trade-off. Um, obviously it could go the other way, but you can always fire the person too. You know, like it's not the end of the, you don't want to do that, but well, you did that after lunch. <laughs> 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 so, it worked out within um, a good hire will pay for themselves and the, you know, in the right, you got to be a certain size, but the, the, you have enough leverage and you're not yep. 300,000 yep. rep. The right hire will pay for themselves. In like six months. So I like a yeah. couple of things. And then as we get into then kind of the second half of the story is, uh, so did you like understanding valuation? So like I talk a lot about with our clients specifically, or people that have been through the training, like when you're thinking about like an asset, like it's an ad back. So like you're, you're, there's in one-time investments. Did you have that mentality when you're thinking about that? Like your, your growth and the investments that you're making, or like what was like a, like, Maybe here's a different way of putting it, Jason. Like, what were your KPIs because of your mindset? Was it normalized EBITDA from day one? Where, like, I try to infuse that into everybody. Like, your net income is just that's the tax. That's the tax man, right? Like, versus the like the investments and all the things that you're doing is the use of cash. You're burning EBITDA, but it's for a return. How did yeah. you? What were your measurements of health while you're running the company? Yeah, so that was one of the benefits of being a buyer. You know, by being on both sides of the transaction, is you see how the process goes. You see what you're paying for upfront. So therefore, it was very natural for me to run, I wouldn't say sophisticated books, but it was like, certainly not receipts in a box. Like <laughs> we want to track our top line. I had to re- readjust some of our cost of goods. Like they had the technician's wages down as, as expenses. Like, no, we need a proper gross margin per unit of service. Then we have our hardcore expenses. Then, then we have whatever, not family, but discretionary money mm-hmm. that's going out that was always other income other expenses okay um, so it wasn't like i don't know i'm sure there's more sophisticated ways to do it but it was just like here's our ebitda like if i had to sell the company we pretty much had that number for the 11 almost 11 years we own the business that's so helpful because like again why we're like this whole conversation you've came at it from the investor's perspective so far so like so many times i have to help people shift from net income k1 yeah. revenue to this is an ebitda that, that normalized ebitda could be larger than your net income because you burn cash so you're just yeah. approaching your decision making differently so over those 11 years is there an example or two because you were kind of walking through contracts expansion obviously you guys got up to the it sounds like, I don't know if you guys got to the 15 million, but on that growth trajectory, were there any kind of decision points where you're like, this is not obvious. So you got your principles, like your people first, yeah, obviously there's certain reasons, but that you're like in it to serve, but you've said IRR multiple times on this call as well. So yeah. like, how are you balancing those two? And then how did that manifest into what man- management? Was if we just simply focused on serving, like, I never knew we had no sales team. My dad was constantly bothering. You need a real sales team like that. We, we kind of dominate the markets we're at. Like, I, I don't know who, what I would pay them to do. Um, <laughs> well, what, where were the leads coming in from? Like in this specialty coffee, like once you have an area, you, there's a certain concentration, like in our local area, it was us and one other company. And your biggest sales that I found was just taking care of the customer every day. 
so that when the the bigger moves came up, contract opportunities, things like that, they just tended to go in our favor. I, mm-hmm. I'm not a genius, just just kept serving people. And what I was specifically told from some of our bigger customers was we did things like listen. We we heard what they were saying and then we we responded and we followed through. Like I know, dude. It's just the okay. basics like we're teaching our kids right now, isn't it? It's, it's so not, funny. Complicated, but doing that consistently um, is very rare, actually. So if you're able to do that and to create alignment with your team around that. And I was, I'm big on systems. We built our own software program. It's like if we're going to do anything consistently, we have to be able to measure it consistently. And looked at a lot of programs, ended up building from scratch our own stuff. And then I had creative freedom to be like, again, to the customer, what's the customer need? What, what do I need to track in order to deliver that? So we're big on big on systems, but just I, I it so were there any specific points where you're like it's not obvious whether I should invest in this or this, like whether it's whether there was like a pull from your morals or something of like like what like whether it was no. It seemed pretty pretty straightforward, and like I never knew where the growth was going to come from, but it just did. Well, uh, I mean, you, but, but you were talking about the category. As yeah. an asset class, or the industry yeah. is growing right. faster than everybody. Yeah, got it. Yeah, You're riding I, a wave. I I came to appreciate that over time. Oh, we did. Uh, we grew by acquisition. I'm totally forgetting that. So um, we took our that was our strategy in a nutshell was taking our cash flow, and we did well. Actually, we only did two deals out of the eleven years, but um, we basically just looked for people that were in our areas or alignment and somehow and use our, use our cash flow to reinvest. And that also helped keep our tax bill down because we were constantly reinvesting. So we had EBITDA, but um, it's pretty good at not paying the tax man too much. It's completely, you know, legal, legally. Yeah, right, right. Reinvesting yeah. the business. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I, I mean, you can do both. You can have the right metrics that you're focused on for the vitals of your, and the health of your company, but you don't have to. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's just a, the perspective and understanding are we measuring the health of the business or are we paying our taxes this year? I mean, like it's yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I like it. You know, I never made any decisions out of tax, but it was like if you if you keep buying companies every couple of years, you'll have enough um depreciation to offset, you know, that, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. growth. And it's kind of a cool problem to have. But if you don't do those acquisitions, there's a lot of you know, lifestyle um blue collar businesses, they make you know a million, two million, three million a year, and you know, they just hand back half of it because they have no production so mm-hmm. um so when you so you got a couple acquisitions under your belt you went from three million and as you're growing i'm trying to think of getting an understanding of did you have a timeline for the for the family uh, fund yeah, or yeah, warren buffett is like indefinite like if it's a good business today and it continues to be a good business tomorrow like keep it um now with that said there, there was a couple of dynamics. So um, I did have a larger vision for Gratuitous Capital. And so I wanted to, as as we got eight, nine years of this, and it was like proof of concept, like this is working. Like we're making money for ourselves. My desire to share that with more people like increased because like, again, I resonate with the guy that kind of wants to do more and has no idea how to do it more, you know? Um, so let's figure out how we could take these cool investments and get them to more people. So started investing in the Cretus Capital, Cretus Funds platform um, to share some of these investment opportunities. So I, I was spending less and less. I was, I was learning how to be a true owner and moving out of the business. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, and then COVID hit. So hey, uh, you thought you could be passive. <laughs> yeah. But actually, what it was is. Uh, um, ESOP, I was, since my dad benefited from ESOP, I was like, ESOP's totally the way. Like I did a ton of research. There's all kinds of really cool tax benefits to do a roll-up strategy and like pay no tax forever and your employees benefit. I was like, came up with this whole thing. Um, you answered, I didn't even have to ask the question. That was going to be one of my questions. And yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's, it's a really dynamic structure if, if you apply it the right way. But um there was a strategic buyer that came along four or five years ago. And I had my next five acquisitions, people that I wanted to target. 
And they were a local company um, that traditionally did kitchen services, but bought a company that had a couple techs, uh, coffee techs. Um, so I'd always reveled in my space was big enough to make it worthwhile for me to do deals, but like not so big that it attracted, you know, the big, big boys. Well, this is the first time that one of the bigger boys started like, Oh, sniffing around and, and looking at it. <laughs> so for like the first year and a half, I just I engaged with them, but I wasn't interested in selling. Um, it was mostly just keep tabs on them. Yeah. Well then in COVID they fired him. And I was like, Oh, okay. So I met the next guy. I was like, let's see if this guy, you know, is he do more of the same? Well, about six months later, uh, yeah, probably the spring of 2020, somewhere there, he bought three of my top five. But like, oh, he got you, beat you to the punch. Oh, no. He got more money, <laughs> uh, way more, more activity. He's meeting with everybody. Um, they had like a mailing service shooting out. Like, I was like, oh, shoot. Like, one of my buddies who I had actually like got to know, and he's like, no, I won't sell. I was like, okay. And I, I would have had to cobble together, you know, seller financing and down payment and bank. And they're able to just cut checks, right? So all of a sudden, my buddy down in Florida, I was like, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> Weren't we going to maybe do something? So that got, it got serious then. I, I knew we could compete with these guys head to head. Like, I wasn't, I wasn't concerned about that. But Compete, compete, sorry for clarification, on the services for a customer or to oh, buy okay. someone? Yeah, good clarification. Buying, no. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's what I was. Get, yeah, right. Initial private equity. They got cash to burn. Um, I was like, shoot, like I'm gonna have to up my. And they talked to everyone. They started shaking all the same trees. You know, it takes time. You know, small industry. There's only so many people ready to sell. I'm like, okay, so there's my growth strategy kind of eating up. Um, but then, uh, yeah, COVID, COVID hit. It's pretty dead set on the east side. I was like, oh, that's pretty elegant, you know, but you don't benefit as the owner. You don't, it truly is a service to your employees because there's very little cash, you know, who's, who's paying, who's giving you money. Um, well, the bank can give you up to 50% at closing. Yeah. 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 So, so, I, mean, you, so you, I mean, you're at least stuff. half of it's coming in warrants or seller financing. You could do it. For years, you can build up cash in the account and and like basically not pay tax on those as you contribute it to the ESOP and then use that money to buy yourself out. But it takes time. Anyway, so I was pretty set on that. And then COVID hit. And then it was like, uh, what I said was the government made us whole cash flow wise. Like I geeked out early on. Uh, I was like, first, I totally ignored it. I was like, this is so stupid. Then I was like, oh, sh shoot. It's real in the sense they're making it real. And um, but those government programs started to come out fairly quickly. And so we became like a, a PhDs in um, uh, all that PPP money. The CARES that. Act and the PPP yeah, and the yeah. ERC, the whole works. Yeah, like who qualifies? How do they qualify? All that stuff. So we were, we, they made us whole cash flow wise. Um, but I knew that sales wise, we had taken a big ding, probably 50% at its worst mm. for the service industry. Um, we had some people, out, uh, out in the, not to get too political, but the communist countries, you know, like California and stuff that were down 90% because they just shut everything down. Um, so I counted ourselves lucky. We had a couple of projects that, that kept us through. We kept all of our employees. I, our mantra was 56 employees in, 56 employees out. That was our, wow. that was our goal. Um, and the government, you know, the- Well, cause, rules, he, cause you were, you're servicing businesses who are not having anybody go to work. Yeah, everything yeah, shut so, down. Um, habits changed the same amount of coffee got consumed, I believe, but they bought more from a grocery, mm -hmm. uh, your, you know, your suburban locations, but caribou actually did really well as one of our, one of our main customers because they were located in, uh, um, you know, they had a lot of drive-through business. So that helped mm -hmm. that whole thing. So just an interesting <laughs> risk exercise. Mm -hmm. So we made whole on that. And, um, but, um, you know, if we were going to sell the company, I knew they had sales had to come back quite a bit um but then you know the conversation well so did you, when you were looking at like your esap so like were you like actually looking at like the discounted cash flow valuation yeah, that I paid, ESAP would you i made paid twenty thirty thousand dollars to have a, a transaction evaluated. did you do like, the whole feasibility study and the whole okay yeah. nice nice so you're like yeah. i'm assuming then because 
this is where like I've seen every kind everything kind of like do a bunch of like tumbles over the last three years. And actually, uh, the economic and M and A update that I did will have released before this conversation. And like ESAP's private equity and strategics have kind of just like ebbing and flowing as far as like the premiums and the net proceeds that people are getting. But yeah. like the ESAP's predicated on sustainable future cash flows to service all of that structure versus yeah. a third party. You got a little bit more synergies in the overlap. Hundred percent. So the rub was we we're at six six point six times earnings. That was that's what they did the research and said was proper for our industry because. You're, you're basically selling to your board. Um, so the board has to approve that this is a proper valuation for employees. So there's a limitation on, on valuation where you go to the market and it's like whatever anybody's yep, going to pay. Yep, right? yep. Um, so we're at 6.6, six, I think, which actually is not that far off from what we went for, but we our profitability is still way down. So I was like, not... Well, not six six, and but just to highlight these concepts for the listeners is that six six, but in what form of deal structure, right? And what does yeah. that mean for your yeah, role and right. everybody? We would have to carry back, you know, twenty, thirty, forty percent of the transaction. Uh, I'm still leery of that. Like, I'm all about borrowing, but if the business, there's got to be a certain amount of margin there, so that, mm-hmm. that it makes mm-hmm. sense. Um, so we researched that, but our sales were still. Still struggling. I think we're down 20, 30% through the end of 21, 2021. Um, but then just one month, uh, I think our average services a day was about 90 and started hitting that those types of numbers again and then started recovering. We'd done some price increases during COVID, so we didn't see them yet because we, uh, yeah. we didn't have the volume to see them. All of a sudden, calls came back and I'm running out like, so 2019 was our high water year. I'm um, starting to run out the projections like, well, geez, we improved this, we improved that. Um, I think we'll get back to where we're at profitability wise in a couple months. And then if you project that out on a rolling basis, like um, I think we could be up five, 10, 20, and end up being 40% uh, profitability that I was able to prove and have part of the valuation process. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and so you, when you say, just for clarification, you have 40% more EBITDA, 40% more oh, enterprise value, or more EBITDA. Holy uh, crap, dude. Seven times, seven times multiple. So not huge, maybe 7.1. So not a huge difference from the ESOP, but the profitability came back. And uh, yeah, I think we're at roughly 140% of 2019 EBITDA. And then I wasn't done yet. There was still a run rate on our momentum. So I was like, I think within six months, you guys will be at uh, 160%. Hmm. And now they have a different cost structure and everything, but I kept pace of the service calls. And, um, you know, they have that amount of gross margin to work off. However they spend it, they spend it. But it. Uh, so what's the conversations like then as you're having this with the person that's eating your competition that you want to acquire? And so... How did you have those conversations to let him know that you're interested, but he's not the only option? Were you playing the ESOP against him? And <laughs> not really. Um, there was no game. I don't. I don't play. If I don't have a game to play, I don't. I don't bluff. Um, but if I have a strong hand, I'll. I'll give it to you. My my biggest hand was. I'm doing pretty good, you know, as is. So he was pursuing me. That helped. Um, then there was this weird period where he Houdini'd for a little while. Uh, this like disappeared. Um, and I was like, is this some sort of weird negotiating tactic? <laughs> what is going on? Um, turns out, so they're buying companies all, all around the country. Their, their headquarters is downtown St. Paul, about a mile from my house. Oh, no. <laughs> He's going to knock on his door. Hey, man, are you still here? <laughs> that actually happened. During, awesome. one of the, during one of the quiet periods, I happened to be around the building and the M&A guy walked by and he like <laughs> did a double take. And I'm like, I swear, I'm not like, I'm not stocking. <laughs> That's awesome. But we ran into each other and it was like, dude, like, wh- where'd you go? He had some personal <laughs> stuff. And then actually their company was bought by Private Equity while we were in conversation. So, Oh, no way. So they, that was the second delay. So we got serious. I sent a bunch of numbers. 
And um, then he disappeared. Then we got serious again. He sent over an LOI, then, then disappeared again. Um, then popped out on the other side. 60 days later, we, we were done. Whoa. Okay. So let's talk about that. So it, you, I mean, it sounds like, did you use an investment banker broker? So you did not. So attorney, CPA, yeah. you, and then what was the, um, what was I going with this? Um, so you have a huge desire. I mean, on Gratus's website, you're talking about people first and like the purpose driven investment yeah. philosophy and all this stuff. Wildly different selling to someone that's on their second PE roll up compared to mm -hmm. an ESOP. So like, how are you reconciling your people first? No ESOP compared to third party sale. Like what were, what were the, yeah, determ yeah. what were the conversations like about what's important after the close? Yeah. So, um, I mean, one of the things my dad challenged me on when I was like, ESOP everything, he's like, you know, how often do you get this qualified of a, of a buyer? I was like, okay. So I'll look into it. So looking into it turned into sending numbers over and all this stuff. Um, what these guys are is, is one of the largest um, and consistent operators. It's an old Ecolab spinoff. So Ecolab had an internal service business. So they, they grew the company quite a bit. And um, what I felt comfortable with, they're locally owned. Like I literally could go and talk to the, to the CEO and stuff like that. Anytime you get big, it's no longer family. It's just not right. It's uh, it's private equity owned, all this stuff. But as far as the Midwestern values and um, the interesting thing about a service business is you, you can't grow a service business and suck at people. Like it's just not possible. Over the long run, my friend, but I'll tell you what, there's a lot of PE firms trying to figure out how to figure out how to not do the service. These guys have been around since the nineties, you know, private equity owned and all this stuff. So, um, you, you just can't do it. Like I've, I've been in it long enough. So I felt I got very comfortable with who they were like all things equal. They're, they're pretty much the only one in the world that can do the things they do. So it wasn't like, I know that there's not six other suitors just like you, but I also know you're buying up all my, I know the same strategic landscape you do. And we're, we're the board. It's not looking, aw it's not looking awesome. <laughs> We're the boardwalk that, you know, you bought Ventura Gardens and these other things. Um, we're boardwalk and I know it and you know, I know it. And, um, you know, but, but you only have, you only have boardwalk and he owns the rest of the board. Yeah. <laughs> so but, he might, he might land on you every once in a while. <laughs> when I come to find out, like just seeing how they do business, like we would have been just fine. Like my cost of service um, I ran Priuses. I like did all these things. I'm just hacking every portion of yeah. the business. You know, they just throw in some gas guzzler and, and, and service vehicle, all this stuff. Like that stuff matters when you multiply that over 35 techs and stuff. So I would have, I would have been just fine, but it, it would have stopped my ability to grow the way I, I wanted to. So creatively speaking, um, it was a super clean cut, all cash deal. They did way more. All cash. No way. Good for you, man. Yeah, all cash. I, I had normally I would have wanted to participate, but I had too many opportunities to do my own thing like outside of that. So um, they did extra due diligence from what I heard. Just like, who's this guy? He just wants to cash out. Like, I'm like, no, no, no. Like, I uh, got a general manager with it, with a strong management team. Here's our software. Like, like any way you want to analyze this thing, it's 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 a strong asset. And uh, what did it feel like? going up to that deal table knowing for 11 years you had prepared for every question that they were going to ask you and you were answering them how did that feel it was um well the like from the confidence of like knowing what i have yeah like what I, you just said like how you even just riffed off a couple of those but like if i'm the buyer and i'm going to ask you all because you know what it's like because you bought the company right yeah so like well, you would and, you, and the reason sorry the, the reason i was asking this jason because like it's not immediate gratification when 11 years ago, you're making a decision that no one knows is the right decision. But then at that moment, well, it's really have... actually, it's taken a year to feel all that. Hmm. It's like, so what happened was we got the LOI and then it was 60 days of due diligence. I had a, I had a guy on staff that was amazing that just produced all this paper, like 
what's the EPA oil spill <laughs> thing? Like what? Like I did multiple deals. Like, do they make this much money? Yes. No. Okay. I think so. Okay. We're doing the deal. You know, they ask about <laughs> every, every last thing you can imagine, um, like lists and lists of spreadsheets and all kinds of crap. So you're in this process at any given point. Like basically what I said is they, they gave me a multiple and they said, yeah, we'll give you that. And I'm like, well, my business is actually going to do this. My 12 months rolling by the time we close is actually going to be here. He's like, well, we'll give you that um, without much resistance. Like if it's actually, <laughs> we're basically like assumption is we're going to beat the tar out of your numbers. And if that holds up, then yeah, we'll give you that number. So I'm waiting during the diligence of like, just, you know, checking my email, all this stuff. Like, is there any, any questions, any, anything they found like bulletproof as far as I know. Um, so you're just waiting and you get closer and closer, <laughs> like don't hear anything, you know, working on all kinds of details on networking capital calculations and blah, blah, blah. But, um, which by the way, when I, just as a small note, when I do a working capital mini series, I'm having you on to talk about this because that is a topic that no one seems to understand. I can be your new, new expert. I mean, <laughs> I knew I, I'm sure with your level of research, I'm sure you'd put into it. And it was important. I was, I was, I did an okay job. Legally speaking, we're resolved now. So, um, I can, I can share, you know, what I learned, but, um, so anyways, it's this whirlwind of activity and you're just, you're just wanting to make sure you answer all the questions. Um, but I knew our business was just come back every month. We were delayed. It was just stronger and stronger and stronger through no, I, I can't take any credit for that. I just knew that was the case. And, um, so you get the closing day, you know, you have the dinner, like the celebration dinner the night before you announce, but you're still not closed. You still, so you're kind of like, yeah, celebrating, but it's not done. Um, and then you tell people, and then it is done. And then you walk away from the office that afternoon, just like it's senior year of high school. Like you've been here for 11 years every day. And then it's like, not every day anymore, but um, you walk away and it's like, I don't, there's no reason I don't need to come back, but everything is like status quo until the very last day. So that was, that was, uh, um, you had very little time to like absorb absorb the how we process that so it, it was kind of funny because you, i i knew we did a decent job of the transition when with our culture and our people so we share this thing and like you know i give a story of like how we got in the business why we did it feeling like we accomplished a lot of that and and looking to the future and talk a little bit about the strategic not threats but like other things going on and how it's important for us to embrace change and um and then you know i share that we're selling the company the first question was um hey are, are we still having the christmas party this year <laughs> uh, out of all the questions you could wonder about uh, you know like hey this that all these people like like hold on a second are, you, are we still doing the christmas party? <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome so um, we had built up, I think, a decent, decent uh, culture where people trusted us to, to look out for the best interests. And honestly, of course, I think I'm the best person to steward that asset. But as I become more and more pulled in different directions, I at some point, I'm no longer the best option to steward that asset. Right. So to hand it off is actually the best thing for our people. Um, and then. We ended up doing, we ended up doing a Christmas party. It was like four months later and it was a good amount of time to have some time to process. Um, and then there was a lot of sense of closure. We were able to do to, to your ESOP question or, you know, how, what did we do? Well, we ended up doing, um, if we had done the ESOP, there'd been a certain amount of money that, you know, we could hopefully set aside for people over the years. So we just kind of tempted to replicate that to some degree with a, with a, portion of those proceeds oh you see you did some bonuses and stuff for everybody yeah yeah nice man it ended up being kind of like you just showed up you know you got something we appreciate it if you if you really were part of the building blocks of the company we tried to try to do a little extra um that's something we felt pretty strongly about um 
super awesome story, man. And so given that what I find interesting about your journey is so coming at it from the finance lens, trying to change and make purpose and impact through investing, you buy the operating business, you eat a bunch of glass, and then you continue to grow. You experience all the challenges that entrepreneurs really do when they're actually running the company, which I find from my personal journeys, it like you can you can think about it as an asset, but then it also becomes part of your identity. I've had that happen yeah. with every one of my ventures. There are people that say that they cannot have it be part of their identity, and like true. And I could see if someone's like Buffett, he's just on the just on the balance sheet on the cap table or something like that. I can understand that, but like, what is your thoughts about the role identity infusion once you own a company and you're part of the the battle wounds like you're talking about? Even though you've you've d demonstrated for almost ninety minutes that you've got the investor mindset, what is your thoughts around this conversation, and how would that be differently for you going forward? I think the unique, a couple of unique things. One is I did have a platform in mind from day one, like to build Gratu's capital into from a tiny little private equity office for my family to something a little bigger, serve more people. So I kind of describe it a little bit like I had, I was playing in two softball games. Like I was running over here to play left field and I was over here mm -hmm, mm -hmm. up our real estate side where you got a regulation A offering and, um, doing doing a new development multifamily for the masses. Anyway, so that was that was my other 80% of my time by the time the deal was done. Um, so in that sense, I was heavily engaged in other other things. So there's a certain sense of, I guess, relief in a sense of like knowing it's, it's a big asset. Like I, I got to do a good job with this thing. So, um, and very trusting in our team, but Buck's, Buck stops with me still. Like if my general manager disappears or who knows what, anything can happen, right? I'm right back running that company. And I'm like this stage of my life, that is not a good fit. So um, that that was a very natural transition. Um, and like now that I'm a year later, it's like a deep, deep sense of uh, satisfaction in the sense to, to what, kind of what you said, like, Glory to God that he guided us to to move in this direction, but really feel like we, we set out to do a thing and we and we did it completely from start to finish, from concept to a theory applied round round trip. How did you celebrate? I honestly have we really haven't yet because you let yourself feel a good feeling though. Like, like, like how did like, cause like, like that's where I go back to 11 years ago. You had this idea in 2008, you set up the, the company name, Reduce capital. Right. So like, mm -hmm. how do you get, yeah, at some point you gotta go like, hell yeah, man, <laughs> or something with someone. Like, totally. It's, um, you know, the, the business generates decent amount of income. Right. So now my focus has shifted to like, uh, I believe we're in a little bit of economic headwind. So we got some short-term plans and then long-term, we got some strategic, we want to acquire businesses that are more strategic with gratuitous capital. And uh, so there's a decent amount of energy that's like, okay, now I got these proceeds, now I got to reinvest these proceeds. So it's like the work's not over. Uh, it's not like you just throw it in some T-bills and walk away or something. Well, I know, but if you don't celebrate, you're going to be Carl Icahn doing margin loans on margin loans on margin loans on margin loans because you haven't rewarded yourself and said, good job. <laughs> true, true that. So we're, I'm still, still working on that part. <laughs> Jason, man, I'm so happy we got to get the catch up on record, man. This has been uh, good for you. I'm so happy for you, man. Like there's certain people where like I, I stumble across people. I'm like, that is just an idea. Like, you know, and there was never once where it was like, I mean, like you were just like idea plus execution, which is very rare, my friend. So you should be very proud. So if you're not going to appreciate it yourself, I'll give it to you. Um, <laughs> so uh, two questions for you, man. Uh, the first one is the name intentional of the show. Uh, I love hearing people's definition of it, the word intentional. So what is your definition of the word intentional? Intentional? Yep. Um. Intentional, I, when I think of the word, it's, I apply it immediately to, to life, like um, 
trying to do things on purpose for a reason, like setting out with an intent. Um, for me, I'm you know, a little analytical, so I like to do the research to figure out if you actually intend to do it, how, how can you actually get it done? So that's. I love it. I love it. <laughs> that's awesome, man. Um, where can people reach you is the last question. What's the best place to follow, reach out, get in touch? What are you up to these days? So the website's gratuitousfunds.com. Um, as we've, you know, enjoyed success with alternative investments, which, you know, this kind of falls in the category. Um, private equity, that's what we've been talking about this whole time. But real estate was one of the foundational assets, too, that got our family into business. Um, we're doing a, a Regulation A offering for a new new fam, uh, uh, new development, multifamily. And traditionally, the asset class has been locked up. You got to have, I don't know million dollar net worth, maybe $250,000 minimums, $50,000 minimums. Our current offering has $10,000 minimum. You can be credited, not accredited. Anyone, anyone can come. But it's really just the idea that uh, if we could all start investing sooner and get better returns, like um, we, we like to think in terms of purpose fuel, like we, we view money as a way to achieve our purpose at a higher level. So we can help people accelerate their, their investing journey. That's, that's our goal at Gertrude's Funds. I love it, man. Been to the website. looks pretty, pretty sweet. And uh, this has been so fun, Jason. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah. Great to catch up. Thanks, Ryan. Well, I had so much fun because it is really fun for me personally, being able to watch people I've built relationships with over the years, do the hard work to get the outcomes that they desired 